Good evening, all you opera cats and gattini dolci. I am Mark Sforzini, Executive and Artistic Director of the St. Petersburg Opera Company, and thank you for joining me tonight for Opera and Chill. Tonight, uh, I'm doing a little preview to our live streaming of Rigoletto at 7 p.m. Um, now, every opera is very special to me that we do at St. Pete Opera, but this one uh, is extra special because this is the last opera we produced before we all went into this uh, sheltering in lockdown phase of our lives. So Rigoletto played at the Palladium the last week of January uh, 2020. And I uh, really, really enjoyed working on this production, and I want to tell you a lot of things about it um, in this half hour. And I'm also going to have the Jilda from that production, uh, Holly Flack, will be joining me shortly. So, um, first of all, some business. How do you get to watch this at 7 p.m. when we live stream Rigoletto? Um, there's a few different ways you can do this. Uh, probably the easiest is to go to our website. So if you go to stpetopera.org, uh, and then this is what you're going to see on the home page. Uh, there's yours truly there with a little quote. We will bring you opera. We will learn what we must to do what we must to keep the music going. And if you scroll down uh, just a little bit, just below that on the home page, you will come to Opera and Chill tonight, Rigoletto, Acts 1, Acts 2, and Acts 3. So that is how you can uh, view the live stream at 7 p.m. There is also uh, the YouTube method. You can go to YouTube and put in St. Petersburg Opera Company. And then if you go and you click on Video, um, you should find the videos down there for the Rigoletto. So that's another way that you can view the opera. And we'll be running Rigoletto all week long for a week. And then uh, next Monday, we'll be doing the Tales of Hoffman, which I'm very excited about. Um, now, I want to thank our production sponsor for Rigoletto, Claudia McCorkle. Um, and I put up a picture here of Claudia. And um, in our program books, we do a write-up um, about our sponsors. And so um, I'll tell you some of what's not on the screen. Um, that Claudia's introduction to grand opera was anything but grand, as she describes it. As a teenager in the Fort Lauderdale area, she skipped a day of a butterfly, and she remembers the beautiful, uh, sad story and beautiful music. Rigoletto is the fifth opera that uh, Claudia sponsored for St. Petersburg Opera. Uh, she started with Carmen and then Il Trovatore, Faust, and Don Giovanni, and uh, now Rigoletto. So uh, we're so grateful to Claudia for her sponsorship and helping make this production possible. So uh, I've got a nice little glass of red wine here, and I want to introduce you to the cast for our Rigoletto. Uh, this is Christopher Holmes. He plays the role of Rigoletto, the hunchback. That's the role for a baritone. And his daughter is Gilda, played by Holly Flack, soprano role, and we'll be interviewing Holly shortly. Um, the Duke of Mantua is played by Benjamin Worley. Uh, that's Ben there, the Duke of Mantua. Now, there's some uh, courtiers in his service. This is Dylan Morangelo, Borsa, one of the courtiers. Also, we have Scott Ballantyne playing Marulo. And then we have uh, some noble people who are associated with the court. Uh, Count Ciprano, played by Vincent Grana. And uh, Count Ciprano has a wife, the Countess Ciprano, played by Sarah Klopfenstein. And uh, the Countess uh, Ciprano is basically seduced by uh, the Duke of Mantua right in front of the Count. He's not very happy about that. Uh, this is Jordan Blair Campbell, and she plays Giovanna. Giovanna is Gilda's nurse. 
Uh, this is Jake Skipworth, and he plays Count Monterone. Uh, Count Monterone is uh, somebody that the Duke has uh, hurt and aggrieved, and he puts a curse on him. This is John Dominic III. He plays Sparfuchil, the assassin. And this is Sparfuchil's sister, Madalena, played by Sarah Norden. She helps him pull off his assassinations. Uh, Vlad Markov plays the small role of the usher in the court. And Emily Hoyman plays the small role of the page. So that is our cast for Rigoletto. And um, I have put together... Um, a short little montage to go through uh, Rigoletto and just uh, point out a few things that you might not normally get to see, uh, well, might not normally get to know about. Here we go. Let's see what we've got here. So we're coming in on the end of the little overture here. It's more like a prelude. I'd call it a prelude. You can hear the brass and winds playing. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, we have to do reductions in the number of woodwinds and brass and percussion players in order to fit an orchestra on stage. So uh, This is a uh, reduction that I actually did uh, many, many years ago, the first time we performed Rigoletto. So this is the opening party scene at the Duke's place, and I like this uh, dance. Choreographer Vanessa Russo put this dance together. A nice uh, spot for it here while the orchestra's playing before any of the singing is started. If you're wondering where the orchestra is, there's no pit. The orchestra is behind the set. You can see the set, um, it looks like some of the columns might be broken on the upper part. I think this is great symbolism that we are dealing with the court of the Duke of Mantua, and this is a court that is in decline, uh, in disrepair. There's Rigoletto going by, and the guy singing is Count Monterone with the fantastic wig done by Scott Daniel. I love that wig. Uh, so Monterone is upset because the Duke has done his daughter wrong and he is getting ready to put a curse on the Duke. And that uh, sort of drives the whole story, this curse. There's the Duke, Ben Worley, right there. No more of us can he says. Costumes by Glenn Breed for Rigoletto. Lighting by Keith Arsenault. Set design by Mike Rowland. And the wigs and makeup by Scott Daniel. I mentioned that before. Love that Monterone wig. Choreographer Vanessa Russo. Fight director and intimacy director was Dan Franca. Listen to the beautiful pianissimo singing from the men's chorus there. They're just stunned after the curse. Here's a little soliloquy moment for Rigoletto, the hunchback. There you go. He's, he, he's constantly singing that, uh, that old man cursed me. He's really haunted by the curse Monterone's placed on him. That's Christopher Holmes playing Rigoletto. Now, we created uh, Rigoletto's house by having a wall come out of the set. You can see the wall on the left side of the screen there. And this partition uh, establishes the difference from being inside Rigoletto's house and where he is now outside. Um, in a courtyard, I guess. And he's about to go in the house 
and greet his daughter, Jilda. Here we go. Crossing into the house, and there's Jilda on the upper platform. Lighting by Keith Arsenault, I think I may have mentioned that already. Stage direction by Carl Hesser. That's Jilda, his daughter. He's uh, really sheltered her from the world, kept her hidden. The court does not know that he has a daughter. In fact, the court mistakenly thinks, the courtiers mistakenly think Jilda is his mistress and not his daughter. Here's Jilda singing about the Duke of Mantua. Of course, she knows him in his disguised version as a poor student. He's been passing himself off as a poor student named Gualtier Malde. That's Giovanna the nurse. And presumably uh, the Duke of Mantua, disguised as the poor student Gualtier Malde, is bribing the nurse to get access to the house. Gilda's saying, I would love him more if he were poor. And here he comes. He startles her. And this is a great duet scene that goes on for quite some time. Here is a little snippet of some of the uh, soft lyrical work in this duet between Holly Flack, Gilda, and Ben Worley, the Duke of Mantua. And Holly will be joining us here momentarily as we wrap up this clip. I'm going to get ready to bring Holly on stage. This is just a little clip from this duet they sing in Act 1. You've got to watch the whole thing so you can hear the cadenza and all the fireworks too. But we're about to cut over now to Holly Flack. I see Holly in the waiting room. Good evening. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm okay. You're a sight for sore eyes. So good to see you. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, I was telling everybody at the beginning of the broadcast, this is the last opera, St. Pete Opera, produced before we went into um, quarantine, I guess if you want to call it, or sheltering in, lockdown, whatever you call it. And... Um, I learned today when I spoke with you earlier that you've um, got a, a job right now to help pay the bills. Tell us what you're doing right now. I am currently a legal secretary for a real estate attorney here in Montclair, New Jersey. Well, um, I'm glad you've you've got something to help pay the bills for the moment. I I am you know lamenting the fact that all of our opera singers are in this position right now of um, having to scramble for some sort of work and um, I, I hold you in such high regard you know you're 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 in the just early stages of such a promising professional career and and it's like a little detour you know but uh, but it's all gonna come back I know we're all gonna come back I'm optimistic you know the, the news from Europe is very hard to so yeah don't stop singing no. <laughs> Don't Keep stop singing. 
I was uh, I was showing the viewers uh, reliving a little bit of this uh, beautiful duet work that um, you and Ben did in the show. You know, Verdi uh, wrote in a letter that he had sort of intended to intended for Rigoletto to be like a series of duets, but you do get the fabulous solo aria Caranome, which you sing after he leaves. You have just learned his name. Uh, and what is going through your head, Gilda? What do you think about when you perform Caranome? And I think it's like six minutes long. What is going through your head while you're singing that? Oh my goodness. Um, just the most pure and innocent love. I mean, she's, she's never seen or met anyone like him before, uh, he is, you know, seemingly pure of heart as well. And she's never seen or met anyone like the, her. The sound of his name, you know, is is like the just creates such ecstasy with her. It's, it's the most beautiful sound he's ever heard. So. And. <laughs> And um, was Gilda a role you had performed prior to um, doing it with St. Pete Opera? I had done a concert version uh, in New York City at Opera America with Lighthouse Opera. Um, but it was wonderful to do it with St. Pete fully staged and, you know, delve into it and really get to kind of act out the, the full effect of the emotions. We did it without scores in the concert version, but it was it was semi-staged, so I didn't really get to let out everything I was feeling. <laughs> and and what a spectacular performance you gave. How do you like singing at the Palladium? What's that like? I love it. It's wonderful. It's It feels large, but also intimate at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the set was beautiful and enormous, and you know the beautiful costumes and the beautiful wigs. Uh, it was it was spectacular, um, in yet such a space that that feels very comfortable. Have you worked um, in the setup before, where the orchestra is on stage behind you rather than in a pit? I have not. This was this was my first time. Although you did come to cover Olympia and Tales of Hoffman, so. You had experienced yeah. our setup then a couple years prior to Rigoletto. So I had. It, 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 was, it wasn't completely a foreign idea. No, but it was, uh, it's, it was a new experience, um, but it's really, it's really very comfortable once you get the hang of it. It's a different way of listening as opposed to trying to sing ahead of an orchestra that's in front of you. You kind of sing exactly with the orchestra um but your cues are incredibly precise and it was wonderful to kind of talk about you know now this is this is what i'm going to show you and it was always very clear um and to be able to have that discussion was lovely so uh in the final act there's a dramatic thunderstorm uh it, I think it's it's one of the great scenes of all operas, this thunderstorm on the outskirts of town and everything that's going down. And um, one of my questions is, um, even after Gilda's father points out to her the the true nature of the Duke, she really she stands by him. In fact, she gives his his life for him to save him. And and why do you think? she does that what's going through your head in that thunderstorm in the final uh, act before you open the tavern door to uh, accept death right. um, I, I thought a lot about it and you know nowadays it's certainly not a notion that uh, anyone would even think of but I think it's it's sort of human nature to think the best of those we love. And um, I think a lot of times, even nowadays, when someone we care about does something less than desirable, perhaps, um, the immediate response is almost always, oh, there was a one-time thing, or they're not really like that. Or, and she is so pure of heart and innocent anyway that if the love hadn't blinded her, to begin with, she 
she leaps to that instinct, even though she's seen him be so untrue to her. Um, there's kind of a, a romantic notion, you know, of using her own life to save his because love, love is everything. So I think she she kind of just goes with her natural instinct that we all feel at some point. And here we have this character, the Duke of Mantua. He was originally called something else. He was based on a real ruler, but the Italian censors, the censors put an end to that because you couldn't like make reference to this real leader who did all these bad things. So it was rewritten and, you know, called the Duke of Mantua. But it's this person who runs his little kingdom. And I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we think it's really a kingdom that's failing in disrepair. It's certainly moral. It seems to be morally corrupt, ethically corrupt, run by the Duke of Mantua. And uh, all this grief befalls the other characters, but he gets off scot-free. What do you think about that? The Duke gets seems to get away with it all. You know, unfortunately, sometimes life isn't very fair. I like to think maybe there's some karma coming to him later down the road, or maybe another lover that he has is is smart, like, you know, Magdalena, and maybe, maybe he'll get his comeuppance in some way. But it's, you know, it's, it's kind of true to life. Sometimes there's just not a punishment that we really want for someone who really deserves it. Right. Life. Sometimes people get away with things. Uh, it would be nice. It, would, it might be fun to see a sequel, you know, Rigoletto 2, the, the story afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Gilda could come back as a ghost. Yeah, there could be a role. There could be a role for Gilda as a ghost. <laughs> So, um, so we're going to, it's, it's so interesting talking to you and I just want to let our people watching know we are going to go a little past seven o'clock cause I got a couple of clips here to show of, um, Holly and I want to talk to her about it, but, um, you can still, um, start watching the Rigoletto a little later, like at seven Oh five or seven ten If you want to stick with us, I pulled a couple of things from our archives um, in addition to doing Gilda at SPO, you have sung the role of Olympia in Pinocchio twice. Um, now, Olympia is originally a character from the Tales of Hoffman. She has a famous doll, doll song, which gets utilized in Pinocchio. So I want to go over and show everybody a little bit of your clip uh, as Olympia. Uh, so let's see if I can get this going. We're transitioning now. With Holly Flack, uh, I wish I wish everybody could have seen your face as you were listening to that in the background. Um, that that montage ended with the meet and greet in the gallery, where the actors and the audience got to meet. You know, you got to meet the children, and there was a little clip of the duet you sing with Pinocchio, and then of course there was an excerpt from the doll song. Um, I think in that particular excerpt, we heard you uh, just ping in on a high E flat and sing a high F also. Um, but you also sing higher than that. What's the what's the highest note you sing in public? The high the highest note I sing in the doll song is a B flat. 
Um, I end on an A flat. The highest note I've ever sung in public is a B above high. And I want to I want to tell everybody that when Holly says a B flat, she's talking about a B flat that is a perfect fourth ab above the queen of the night high F, which is like a famous high note. So this is an entire perfect fourth higher than that. And um, I'm always bragging to people when you're here doing a show, I'm, I'm always like, Holly Flax singing a high B flat in Price Hall at Opera Central because you know the the Met Opera made a really big deal a couple years ago that somebody in a live performance had sung a high A on the Met yeah. stage and yeah. this is this is the note above that so this is even higher than the Met um, and it's also I want to add it's not just that these pitches are coming out of your mouth but they are sung so beautifully like pearls i mean you know it's one thing to say oh i can hit a certain note it's another thing to hit it consistently with beauty and great intonation so it's just one of the many facets of your of your singing which is um admirable um, of course, you have such a lyrical, beautiful sense of, of phrasing, and I could go on and on and on. I also want to say, um, right as I was going to the Pinocchio clip, I saw on my cell phone here, it says Stephen Ray is watching. So hello to Stephen Ray, who was the uh, stage director for the Pinocchio this last year, um, which your clip was, was just taken from. Uh, nice to see that Stephen is watching. And I also see that Sarah Klopfenstein, our um, Countess Ciprano, is, is watching as well. So yes. So high B flat, and, and the kids always go mad for that. Tell us a little bit about what it's like to perform the Pinocchio. Uh, we do we did four shows for third graders who had come in from um, elementary schools. What's that like performing for these children? Well, it's pretty incredible because they they're a very captive audience, um, and they really respond to things um, that you do, you know, jokes or things that happen or emotional moments. Um, but they also, you really have to sell it to them. I think they can tell if you're not being genuine about something and they really get invested when you, um, you know, kind of kind of act truly to them. And it's, it's such a pure story. You know, the, the moral is always tell the truth and they kind of know the fairy tale Pinocchio um, already, but it's sort of so it it sort of takes them down a path that they they're familiar with a little bit, but um, you know, and it just implants little earworms here and there uh, in the language that they understand. So uh, it's it's fun to hear their reactions sometimes when you we rehearse you know to to no audience at all, and then when the kids just have such a visceral reaction uh it's it's funny and it's it's fun to be around while you were here for pinocchio you did an outreach for saint pete opera at the salvador dali museum uh you were joined by um taylor alexis dupont the pinocchio from that production and the two of you did um each did some solos and also did some duets you did the famous lock may duet flower duet from lock may um, what was that like performing on the staircase of the Dali Museum way up there in the air? Oh, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's a completely unique museum. I've never been in, in a building like that, let alone a museum. And you're, it's neat that you, you, you're kind of in the middle of the staircase. So you can see people down below, but there's also people kind of around you up above. And the acoustics are really incredible and you don't, you don't really have to try to kind of you know hear yourself and let it out and it's it's awesome i like this it's incredible and when you were here for rigoletto um we had one of our broadway cabarets and uh you know let me ask this question is there a, a um a Broadway role that you would like to perform in your lifetime, something you're just dying to perform? Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> probably Christine from Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> okay. 
I know that gets a bad rap from some people, but um, it was the it was the first musical I ever saw uh, when I was four years old, and it it really got me into singing and, and opera. And um, you know, I've known all the words by heart since I was young, playing the cassette tape. I think I wore out the little ribbon from that. So, um, so I was going to ask you how you got into singing and opera. I mean, were you were you charged up about opera as early as four? I well, I think I think Phantom of the Opera helped because it it's it's kind of a weird musical where it's is it is it verging on opera? You know, there's there's dresses, there's not a lot of speaking, and so my parents had season tickets to Portland Opera. So I think the next opera I saw after that was Madame of Butterfly. And just, you know, kind of was hooked into opera because of the, the spectacle and, you know, the way the voices sounded. So that was, and we have, we had Oregon Public Broadcasting on the radio 24 seven in my house. So, so classical music, and I grew up playing violin, uh, brother closest in age to me also played violin and the youngest of five siblings. Oh, how so, many years did you play the violin for? I played it for about, about 14 years. I, I was four and then I played it through high school and then actually in college we could take instrumental conducting where you you played your instrument while someone else conducted and then you all switched. So I got to, I got to hang on for it for a couple of years. Well, uh, I mentioned earlier in the broadcast that Madama Butterfly was the first opera our production sponsor, Claudia McCorkle, ever saw when she was 14 um, and got her excited about opera. So um, so I mentioned um, the Broadway Cabaret, and I do have a, sh a short little montage um, of your work in the Broadway Cabaret, a clip of you singing some of Glitter and Be Gay, which is from Candide by Leonard Bernstein. Oh, and then uh, some of the duet you did with Ben Worley, uh, Tony and Maria from West Side Story. So let's take a little listen to a little bit of this. Holly Flack. That was a little excerpt from our Broadway cabarets, uh, Broadway cabaret at the end of January 2020. They usually sell out. Uh, a fun thing, I mean, how does it feel? You're hired to sing a big opera role, and then the company says, oh, by the way, can you sing some favorite Broadway? I mean, how does that, how does that work for you? How does that work out for you? Oh, it's wonderful. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of a way to let loose and and have a good time and um because they were they were favorites you know we didn't have to kind of learn something new or stress about thinking of something else it was you know something something that you already love to do um and something that's fun and completely different from rigoletto so you kind of it's it's something different which which makes it fun 
Well, Holly, um, I want to thank you for being my guest tonight. You have brought so much joy to our St. Petersburg Opera audiences um, as Gilda in a main stage production, but all the um, thousand, one thousand, you know, school children you touched um, in Pinocchio with your performance as Olympia and your outreach to the Dali Museum and your stunning performances in the Broadway Cabaret. Um, you are a bright shining star that is rising and you know just keep keep your singing going because this is not going to last forever and then uh you are going to be back out there um you know bringing all this joy to people well thank you so much that's that's very kind of you to say it's it's a it's a it's a bright spot in the middle of you know all this happening to to come home after you know, the day job and just sing a little something and helps keep the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, um, uh, thank you so much, Holly, and I want to thank all of our listeners for joining me. I am Mark Sforzini. I'm signing off for St. Petersburg Opera Company, keeping our listeners and our artists in our hearts. Thank you and have a great night. Bye, Holly. See you soon. Bye.